Welcome. In this video, we're going to look at some of the most common errors that students make in their specialist maths exams. We'll start from some classic rookie errors and work our way up to some more subtle errors that you all need to be careful of. All right, let's do it. So in this complex numbers problem, it's a cubic polynomial. We're given one solution and we want to find all others. So we can use the conjugate root theorem. So z equals 1 plus i is going to be a second solution. And then we multiply these two together to get this quadratic term. The original was a cubic, so the third solution must be linear. Now there's a few ways you could work that out, but one way is to use that 6z term um, to solve for the value of b. We can work out that b must be 2. So you might say the third solution is z minus 2. Okay, so actually z minus 2 is the factor, but the question is asking about the solution, so it should be z equals 2. So remember, the factors are the expressions that multiply to give p of z. Just like factors of a number multiply to give the number. Whereas the roots are the solutions to p of z equals 0. So in this case, z equals 2, z equals 1 minus i, those are the other roots or the other solutions. So this is a calculus question. We need to find the gradient of this curve at a certain point. You might recognize we need to use implicit differentiation. We'll need a product rule for that first product of terms and actually a chain rule inside that product rule to differentiate the sine of y. And then we'll need another product rule for the second product x times y. Now we want to sub in x equals pi on 6, y equals pi on 6. Now when we do that, sine of pi on 6, uh, root 3 on 2, cosine of pi on 6, a half. Alright, so of course, sine of pi on 6 is a half, cosine of pi on 6 is root 3 on 2. I'm sure you all know that, but everyone makes mistakes, so just check it carefully. Once we have it, uh, we can just isolate dy dx and then rearrange in order to solve the problem. In this question, we're given a velocity function and we're asked to find the acceleration. So what could we do? We'll go ahead and differentiate dv dx. Uh, we can use a product rule or we can use our calculator to get that derivative. Uh, we looked at the options and we recognize option C looks pretty good. Did you pick that one up? Acceleration is dv dt or v dv dx. So here we need to multiply our dv dx by another copy of v, uh, expand out the brackets, and then we have to do a little bit of work actually to recognize the correct option using a trig formula. It's actually option A. So remember, acceleration is v times dv dx. Okay, in this vectors question, we're given three position vectors. We're given the magnitude of angle B, C, D, and we need to find this unknown constant A. So if we go ahead and start getting vectors B, C as C minus B, and C, D as D minus C, so we can work those out. And then we know that a scalar product can be used to give the angle. So if we set up a scalar product formula, which is on our formula sheet, and we've got a dot product over a product of magnitudes, and then we work those out, and that should give us an equation to solve for A. Okay, a diagram is useful. So if we have angle B, C, D in our scalar product formula, the vectors are actually C, B, and C, D. So we need to change those, and what we'd actually find is we just get a sign change on the numerator there, and with the cosine, that's actually going to give us the supplementary angle, okay? So uh, 180 minus theta. But yeah, if you just draw a diagram, you should avoid that problem and put your vectors tail to tail. So with this question, it's a graph sketching question, but it's exam two, so we have our CAS calculator. So we type it in in the graphs page, just of course make sure to type it in correctly and check that you don't make any errors when typing the actual function in. 
Uh, we get our graph and we got to find the local maximum. So um, analyze graph maximum. We can sort of see where it is there. Just locate the coordinates. We also need to label the point of inflection. We can probably tell that's going to be uh, slightly to the right of the maximum, somewhere around here. And finally, we need the x-intercepts. So analyze graph zero and we can find those. Once we've found all those, we probably think we're pretty good, right? So the problem here is the scale or, or the window. If we look on the exam paper, it goes up to y equals 15. So if we set that on our CAS calculator, we actually realize we've missed out a whole region of the graph. So as a general rule, just look at the scale provided on the exam paper and use those settings to set your CAS window. Then you should avoid that error. So this one's going to cover several of the common errors uh, with integration because it's such a big part of the course. So first one is forgetting to write a dx on the end of an integral. So always check that. Next one is writing a dx when it should be a dt. Next one is integrating but then forgetting to add your constant of integration. That can really mess you up. Integrating log and forgetting a modulus. Calculating a volume of a solid and forgetting the pi. Calculating an arc length integral and forgetting the square root. And of course, finding the area of a function that's below the x-axis and forgetting to reverse the sign. So a lot of possible errors there, but there's a lot of different types of integrals and it's just wise to be careful. All right, this one is about points of inflection. So this was an exam one question where students had to find a first derivative and then hence showed that the graph of f has a point of inflection at x equals two. So the most common error was to try to show that the second derivative at two was zero. So finding the second derivative using the chain rule, subbing in two, yes, it is zero, but, but it's not enough, right? So the second derivative not only has to be zero, but it has to change sign. So here a student would have had to show that to the left of that point x equals two, uh, the second derivative was negative, and then to the right, it changed to positive. Another way you could have done it, because an equivalent definition for a point of inflection is where the first derivative has a local maximum or minimum. Okay, it's a point of maximum or minimum gradient. So in this example, we've got a parabola on the denominator there of the first derivative. And that parabola is going to have a turning point uh, at x equals 2. So by showing that, then the reciprocal would also have a turning point, and therefore f would have a point of inflection. So that concept has come up a few times, so watch out for it. I've got another video on points of inflection if you're interested. Alright, so in this question, we have the random variables, uh, masses of oranges and lemons. We're given the mean and standard deviation, and we were asked about the mean and standard deviation for three oranges and two lemons. So we have these formulas from our formula sheet, and we can use them. The mean is just as you would think. We just take the mean um, mass of the orange times it by three, the mean mass of the lemon times it by two, and we get our mean total mass. But for the variance, so the formula says a squared times variance of x plus b squared times variance of y. But that's not what we want here. Okay, that would be if we had selected one orange and multiplied the mass by three and same for the lemons, but that's not what we've done. We've actually selected three different oranges and two different lemons. So it's a different situation and the variance is going to be uh, different. So what we're actually gonna have here is the sum of five different variances. Now, three of those variances are the same. So it's three times the variance of an orange uh, plus two times the variance of a lemon. So it's a subtle difference, but the key thing is, are we selecting one object and multiplying it by a scalar, or are we selecting several different objects? Well, that's what we're doing here. So feel free to watch that again if you wish. 
But otherwise, let's move on. All right, we're getting more advanced here. This was the last question on an exam one a few years ago. And it's an arc length question. We're going to find the distance using an integral. So we're going to use an arc length formula, find dx dt, dy dt, and square them. And that took a bit of work because that dy dt is a pretty uh, intense function. So we had to simplify that. And if students were able to simplify it and and then simplify it again, they could find that actually you get a perfect square inside the square root, uh, which is good, right? Because there's no square root in the answer. So we know that has to cancel. So what they did was, well, I know that's the square of t squared minus two. So then I can match up a, b, and c and get my answer. So what's the domain restriction? t is between zero and one. And if we look at the expression in the bracket, that's always going to be negative. So when we square that and square root it, we've actually reversed the sign of that negative. So what the expression should be is negative t squared plus two, and that's gonna give our answer. But yeah, quite tricky there. So watch out for those domain restrictions, especially if you're aiming for those really high marks. All right, last one. RTFQ, which of course stands for read the full question. So if you've done some practice exams, you'll know every year on the VCAR assessors report, they always say that students had trouble reading and responding to all aspects of the questions. Now that could be anything from misinterpreting the question, answering only part of the question, answering a different question or a slightly different question, giving a decimal answer instead of an exact one, which should be the default, or giving a decimal answer but the wrong number of decimal places, kind of annoying, or overlooking some key information in the question, kind of like that domain restrictions one we just saw. All right, key takeaway, anyone taking an exam is going to make mistakes. That's normal, expect it. And the more you can find your own errors and correct them, you'll find your score will dramatically improve. All the best. Thank you.